morning and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to spend some time today talking about the uh, E2 visa investor requirements and also some renewal considerations. Um, a few things before we get started. Uh, so some of you may know this firm was founded on an E2 visa several years ago. Our founder, Ian Scott, is um, in the U.S. personally on an E2 visa. Um, Scott Legal is also a full service immigration firm, but focuses primarily on E2 visas. Uh, we've processed hundreds of these visas, and we typically process E2 visas that are higher risk, uh, meaning there are kind of lower investment amounts than you would normally see. Uh, we've processed at consulates around the world, um, and we also process very frequently uh, in London and Toronto. So we will continue our webinar series, um, doing a few webinars a month on different immigration topics. Um, and at the end of this webinar, we're going to send out a few things. So one is a PowerPoint um, that you'll see here today. Uh, another is a comprehensive E2 visa guide, and then also a link to where you can sign up for additional webinars. Um, for our panelists today, um, we're very lucky to have uh, Michaela Brazdova romeser who is a senior associate at the firm and has extensive experience uh, processing E2 visas. My name is Kelly Wiener, and I'm a partner at Scout Legal, and I'll be speaking in the uh, latter half of the presentation. Um, if you have questions, please go ahead and send them through the chat box and we'll make time for questions at the end. And also this webinar is being recorded and will be made available um, on our YouTube channel uh, for you to view. Uh, so now I will turn it over to Michaela um, to get us started with the E2 visa rules and regulations. Thank you so much, Kelly, and uh, good morning, everyone. So yeah, well, let's get started with the basic um, E2 visa requirements. Um, so E2 visa is a non-immigrant visa um, that allows nationals of certain countries to come to the US um, to develop and direct the operations of an enterprise in which um, they have invested money. So there are two ways how you can um, how you can obtain an E2 visa. So you can either uh, purchase um, an existing business um, that is already operating in the US. Um, this can also be um, a franchise, for example, or um, if you would like to start your own business, um, that is that is an option as well. And in this case, um, you would have to set up um, an entity in the US and then start invest money in this um, in this new business and then start um, start the new business in the US. So um, for you to qualify for an E2 visa, um, there must be a treaty between the US um, and your home country. Um, so many countries um, all over the world are E2 visa treaty countries. So many countries in Europe, Africa, Asia, Latin America or Middle East um, are E2 visa treaty countries. So um, you would just want to double check if, if your country is part of this uh, part of this program. What is important to keep in mind here is that, um, you know, you, you only have to have a passport of the E2 visa treaty country. Um, you do not have to be born, um, you know, in, in that country. So like, let's say, for example, that you were born um, in China or India. Um, unfortunately, these two countries are not are not E2 visa treaty countries, but like, let's say that later in your life, um, you got citizenship um, of, for example, um, Canada, UK, um, Italy, or, you know, any of the E2 visa treaty countries, um, you could still qualify for um, the E2 visa and apply with the passport of, um, of that country. So um, for how long can your um, E2 visa um, be issued for? Um, so this will depend on your um, country of nationality. Um, so different countries, um, you know, have, have like different lengths um, for, for which the E2 visa can be issued for. Um, so uh, many, many countries, uh, you know, nationals of many, many countries can get the E2 visa um, for um, five years. So for example, nationals of, of Canada, um, UK, um, Australia can get the E2 visa for five years. But there are some countries, um, you know, and nationals of these countries can will only be issued um, the E2 visa for a shorter period of time. Um, so there are some countries, um, you know, and, and nationals of these countries, for example, Jordan is one of them. Um, you know, these nationals can only get the E2 visa for um, three months. And so what this means, um, so in either case, um, if you are issued the E2 visa for three months or if you are uh, issued the E2 visa for five years, 
in either of these um, cases, um, you know, every time you enter the U.S., um, you will be um, allowed to stay in the U.S. for up to two years in E2 status. So let's say that you are a national of Jordan, you got the E2 visa for three months, but you enter the U.S. Um, on the E2 visa, you will still be allowed to stay for a period of two years. And then, um, you know, during the period of two years, um, you can stay in the US, but if you leave the US and your visa has already expired, then you would have to get a new visa at a consulate. Now, let's say that you are a national um, of Canada and you got the E2 visa for five years, Every time, like as long as your E2 visa remains valid, every time you enter the U.S., you will also be allowed to stay um, for uh, for up to two years. So, um, you know, you wouldn't be allowed to stay the, the the full five years. You would just have to leave the U.S. and re-enter. And every time you re-enter, um, you would get two years um, in in E2 status. And after, um, you know, after the E2 visa expires, so like let's say that you are national of Canada, uh, UK or Australia, for example, you got the E2 visa for five years. Um, let's say that your E2 visa, um, you know, is expiring in like the next six months. Um, you would want to start um, working on your um, E2 visa renewal application, and then you can renew the visa and then it will be renewed um, usually for the same uh, period of time. So for another five years. And the advantage of the E2 visa is that there is no like limit as to how many times you can renew it. So, um, you know, you could, um, you know, you could be renewing it, um, you know, potentially indefinitely. Um, we have many clients that have renewed, you know, three times or more um, for five years and they, as long as you qualify and you, you meet the requirements, um, you know, you could renew the, the E2 visa. Perfect. So now let's move on and let's go over um, the requirements in a little bit more details. So um, the first one is, and we already discussed this one, is that you must be a national of a treaty country. Um, the second one is that you must make an investment in the U.S. So it's an E2 um, investor visa. Um, so um, this is a really important requirement that you must make a substantial investment, um, you know, in, in the business um, in the U.S. And so what does this mean? So, um, you know, the funds or the money you will be investing must be at risk. And so what this means that the, is that the money... Um, has already been spent at the time of your interview and the money just cannot cannot just be like sitting on your bank account so um you know at the time you are applying for um, the e2 visa and you have the interview at the consulate the officer will want to see that you have already made that substantial um, investment in the us you have already invested the money um you know if you just transfer you know hundred thousand dollars from your personal account on the company's um us bank account but like you don't spend any money it's just sitting um it's just sitting on your um sitting on your bank account that wouldn't be considered um an at risk investment for um the purposes of e2 visa so um you know really the the officers will want to see that um you know you um you have spent the money at the time you are applying for e2 visa so um the the government will also want to see um, supporting documents about, um, you know, like what is the source of the of the money um, you are investing in the business. Um, so um, here it can be any legitimate source. Um, so, you know, let's say that you have been um, saving um, money um, from your employment um, and, you know, and, and this will be the source for the investment, you know, that's fine. Um, we would just want to submit um, two or three most recent tax returns, you know, that shows that, um, you know, you um, you have been employed and you declared that income and pay taxes on the on that income in your home country. Um, it can also be the source for investment can also be a gift. Um, so anyone can give you um, a gift, you know, it can be a family member, a friend, um, anyone, um, you know, in this case, uh, we would um, be submitting a gift letter from the person who is gifting you the funds. And we would also need to submit some documents explaining where the, the donor, the person who is giving you the, the, the money, how, how they obtain the funds. So, you know, like, let's say that your family member is gifting you funds and the money is coming from their, um, you know, savings from um, employment over some period of time, then we would need to submit their tax returns, you know, again, showing that, um, you know, they, they had the employment and they um, declared the income. 
um, you know, the money can, um, another common source of funds is, for example, if you say, if you sell um, a house or a property. Um, so in this case, we would be submitting a purchase sale um, agreement for the property um, to show, you know, like this is the source of the funds. And then um, the source of funds can also be a loan. Um, so again, it, this can be a loan from, um, you know, a family member, a friend. It can be also a loan from um, a financial institution. Um, you know, any any type of loan will, um, you know, will will work. The loan can be um, secured, unsecured. Um, the only thing, um, you know, that it will not work for the E2 visa is if the loan um, is secured by the assets of the E2 company. Um, so unfortunately that will not work, but like, let's say that yet you take a loan and, and it's secured by your uh, property in your home country, you know, that's, um, that's fine for the E2 visa. So, um, the, in, in the investment you are making, uh, must be substantial and we'll discuss, um, this in more detail on the next slide. Um, so what are some typical, um, E2 visa expenditures. So, um, you know, if you are purchasing um, a business, um, you know, then the, um, the, 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 the expenditure or the investment will be the purchase price you are paying for uh, the business. Uh, in case you are starting your own business, then, um, you know, anything really you need to get that business up and running will be able to include as part of, of the investment. So, you know, any fees you pay for like the business entity um, set up, we can include, um, you know, in, in case you will be selling um, some products in the U.S., you know, we can include any inventory um, you purchase either in the U.S. or let's say that you purchase it abroad and import it, we can include that as well. You know, any computer equipment, office supplies, office equipment, we can include all of that. Um, any money you pay for a website setup, um, you know, marketing, uh, we can include all of that. And the expenditures will kind of differ on the type of business you will be starting. Um, but, um, you know, the keys that, you know, we can include um, any expenditures, you know, that are necessary to get that particular business um, up and running. And um, one other thing I wanted to mention, um, you know, in case you are thinking about purchasing um, a business in the U.S., is that, um, you know, there are two options, you know, how to kind of structure the deal. So you can either, you know, transfer the money directly to the seller um, or, um, you know, the money can also go through an escrow. And so what this means is that, um, you know, you, um, you would sign a purchase sale agreement. You would also sign an escrow agreement and then you would, um, transfer the money to the, to the escrow agent and the escrow agent would hold the money until there is a decision, a final decision from the consulate or USCIS on the E2 visa application. And so um, if the government approves the E2 visa, then the escrow agent would transfer the money to the seller. In case they deny the visa for any reason, then the escrow agent would um, return the funds back to you. Um, so, you know, some people prefer to... Um, to um to go through the you know through the escrow option just because you know like let's say that for any reason um the e2 visa is not approved you know they can still get um the funds back and um one important thing to to note about the escrow is that um you know like all the contingencies for for the transaction um uh, must have been satisfied and then the only contingency left is the um you know the the decision on the on the e2 visa um, so um, that's important to keep in mind. Uh, the next requirement is that the E2 business, um, the, the company cannot be marginal. And so what this means um, really is that the company must, um, must be able to hire U.S. employees. Um, so, um, you know, you don't have to have U.S. employees or employees um, in the company at the time you are applying for the initial E2, but you would want to have at least um, three or four full-time employees by year five of um, operations. And so how can you show, um, you know, that you you have employees or you will have employees in the next five years? Um, so, you know, in case you are purchasing an already existing business, um, you know, this would be shown on the on the company's, you know, W-2s or on the on the payroll. Um, so in this case, you know, the the you know, if you're purchasing an existing business, the business would usually already have some employees. 
um, in case you are starting um, your own business, um, you know, again, like there is an option to hire um, employees before you get the E2 visa, but many people kind of prefer to wait, get the visa, come to the US and hire employees um, at that point. Um, so in this case, you would be submitting a business plan with your application and in the business plan, you would outline um, your hiring projections for the next five years. Um, and you would want to show in, in those hiring projections that you will have um, at least three or four um, employees by, by year five. So another requirement is that uh, the business must be um, real and operating. Um, and so what this means is that, um, you know, let's say that you are, that you purchased an already um, existing company, um, you know, in that case, what this requirement uh, would mean or how we would show, uh, how, how we would prove this requirement is that, um, you know, the business already um, collecting revenue, um, you know, is um, servicing clients, you know, like selling products. So we would be submitting things like, um, you know, invoices, the company um, recently issued, you know, incoming payments from clients, you know, contracts with clients or things like that. Um, let's say that you are starting your own business and, you know, like everything is um, set up. So you, um, you, you know, like you paid for or you have an office lease signed, you know, everything is ready to kind of, um, you know, the business is ready to start operating, but you haven't started taking revenue yet. Um, you know, that's fine as well. Like the company um, doesn't have to start taking revenue um, until after you get the E2 visa. But in this case, you would want to show that everything is kind of like ready. Um, you know, the business is ready to um, start operating and really kind of like the only thing missing is you coming to the US and, and start, you know, and starting managing the, the, the business. So you would want to show that you sign um, commercial lease, you know, you have entity set up. You know, there is a website created, um, you know, you have letters intent with potential clients or a contract signed uh, with clients. Um, you have all the necessary licenses you need, um, if you need any licenses. And then really, you know, everything is ready. Um, you know, the business is ready. And once you come to the U.S., you know, the business will start um, kind of taking revenue um, soon after that. So the next requirement is that you will have to um, solely develop um, and direct um, the E2 business. And so this means that, um, you know, you will have um, like an executive or managerial role in the E2 company and you will be managing the operations of the E2 business. So, you know, let's say that, you know, like your plan is to come to the U.S., but, you know, you have this entity in the U.S., but you know, your plan is really just to kind of retire and you don't want to, you know, you know, you don't really want to manage the, the company, you know, in this case, the E2 um, visa, you know, would not be um, a good option because you wouldn't have that active role um, in the company. Um, so, you know, this is what the requirement means is that, you know, like if you are coming to the US on the E2 visa, um, you must have that active role um, in managing um, the operations of the of the company. Uh, the next requirement is that you must own at least 50% um, in the E2 company. Um, so, you know, for um, the E2 visa, uh, you know, usually, you know, in, in most of the cases, you know, there will be an entity set up in the U.S., and uh, you, you must own at least 50%. So, um, you, you know... Uh, in many cases, you know, the investor owns 100%. Sometimes, um, you know, it's it's less, but it always has to be at least 50%. Um, and this is a requirement you have to meet at the time you are applying for the E2 visa, but also you always have to keep that 50% ownership. So like, let's say that, you know, like you owned, um, you know, 100%, but then like, like in year two, after you came to the US on the E2 visa, you sold 60% to someone else. Now you have only 40, uh, you would no longer qualify for, um, you know, for the E2 visa. So this is really important thing to keep in mind is that you have to always keep at least 50% ownership in the company. And then um, the last requirement is that you must have intent to return to your home country once your E2 visa expires. And, um, you know, really what this means for um, the E2 visa is um, the government, um, you know, usually only want to see kind of like a signed declaration by you um, that says that once your E2 visa expires, um, you plan to return to your home country. Um, you know, they usually don't want to see like any other documents showing, you know, ties to the home country or, you know, like showing that you have property or kind of like bank accounts and funds 
in your home country. So really what is needed um, only for the E2 visa applicants is this signed um, declaration of intent to return. Um, and also, you know, this signed declaration doesn't prevent you from um, kind of renewing the E2 visa. So, um, you know, you can you can still renew. You would just have to return to your home country, renew the visa, and then, you know, you can um, you can come back to the to the U.S. if it's approved. Perfect. So now um, let's move on and um, let's discuss, um, you know, how much money um, you have to invest um, in the U.S. to to qualify for um, the E2 visa. So um, for the E2 visa, the, the investment must be um, substantial, uh, but there is no kind of like minimum said money, you know, like in the regulations, like there is no definition, you know, like if you invest over $150,000, you know, like your application, like that's substantial and this requirement will be met. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the amount is um, nowhere, you know, is not defined anywhere. Um, so the money you will have to invest will depend on, um, you know, several things. So it will depend on the type of business you are starting. Um, so, you know, like if you are starting like a consulting business or a service-based business, um, you know, your startup expenditures will be much lower than, you know, like, let's say if you're starting like a restaurant, because in that case, you know, like you would have to get all the equipment, you know, like. Uh, lease a huge, um, you know, like restaurant space. So it's really going to depend on the type of business you are starting. Um, it's also going to depend on um, which consulate or, you know, like where you are applying. Are you applying at a consulate? Which consulate are you applying with USCIS? Um, you know, some consulates just um, are just used to kind of like seeing, um, you know, like large um investment investment amounts and so like if you go to that consulate and your investment amount is like sixty seven thousand dollars they are just not used to that and they may um, deny and you could have been approved at another consulate so um it's going to depend on that and also on the examiner um you know on the on the consular officer um and then um, it's also going to um, depend on the overall strength of the of the application. So, like, let's say that your um, investment amount um, is on the you know is on the lower side. You know, like, let's say that you invested around like sixty thousand dollars, but you already hired you know two employees. Uh, the business has started operating and has started taking um, I don't know twenty thousand you know like in in revenue per month. So in this case, um, I would say that you know the the case is very um, is very approvable because you know like even though the investment amount is on the is on the lower side, um, you you hired employees and the business is already taking revenue. So you know those um, would definitely help the the application. So um, in case you are buying a business, um, you know, then, um, you know, what the government would look at is kind of like the, the purchase price you paid for a business and then um, the fair market value of the business, then they would kind of like compare the two, um, two prices. And if they are, you know, the same or kind of similar, um, then they would conclude that you, um, you know, you invested substantial amount of money um, in the E2 business. So um, franchises, so as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, franchises are um, a good option for um, E2 visas. You know, many people um, like franchises. Um, you know, we have done many, um, many E2 visas for different types of franchises. Um, so franchises can definitely, um, you know, if, if you buy a franchise, um, you can definitely qualify for an E2 visa. Um, and let's discuss some common, um, you know, good versus bad um, E2 visa expenditures. So, you know, good um, E2 visa expenditures are, you know, um, so I'm going to name some. So, you know, for example, any money you pay um, for um, the business entity set up, you know, to set up the company in the U.S., um, any money you pay for a website, um, you know, marketing, um, any money you pay for like subscriptions or, or software um, you need, um, any money you pay for a computer, office equipment, furniture, um, if you will be selling something, any money you pay for inventory. Um, some, you know, some bad or weak E2 visa expenditures are, for example, um, you know, um, money you, you know, like let's say that you come to the U.S. on a B visa to kind of investigate E2 visa opportunities and you want to include um, like the, the, the 
the money you paid for a flight or a hotel or Uber transportation. So those would be um, generally weak E2 visa expenditures. We wouldn't uh, we wouldn't include them. And also one um, kind of um, weak expenditure is car. And this will kind of depend on the type of business you are starting. So, you know, car um, is going to be a, a good expenditure if you are starting, for example, um, you know, like a food truck or a car transportation company or a food delivery company. Um, also, you know, like construction company um, in case you need to like transport all the materials and equipment. So in those cases, it would be um, strong E2 visa expenditure. Let's say that you are starting any other business, you know, like let's say that you are starting a consulting business and, you know, like you would just need the car to kind of like commute to the office. Um, you know, in that case, it would be, it would not be a strong e 2 visa expenditure and we would not include in the application because, um, you know, the, the consular officer would probably push back on that um, expenditure. Perfect. So now let's move on um, and let's discuss if you have to hire employees. Um, so um, so you, you do not need to hire employees before you apply for the E2 visa. Um, it's definitely, you know, like if you are able to, it's definitely going to help the application, but it's not a requirement. Uh, but you do need to hire employees. Um, you know, in the next five years um, of the operations of your of your business, and this is so called uh, marginality requirement. So, um, you know, a common question we get is, um, you know, do I have to hire uh, W two employees or can I hire ten ninety nine contractors? So, um, you know, W two employees are always better. Um, so we encourage to hire W two employees. Um, you know, it, in some uh, industries, you know, like a construction industry or um, home improvement, you know, industry, like if you have a company in those industries, um, you know, um, there, um, you know, it's common to hire contractors. So, um, you know, in those cases, contractors may be fine. But even in that case, we would still recommend that you hire, you know, like, let's say, for example, like a secretary or like an office admin person as a W-2 employee um, to, you know, to, to show that you have some W-2 employees. Um, so how do you prove that you, um, that you, um, you know, you have these employees? So, um, if you are starting a new business and you are applying for an E2 visa, you would submit a business plan, um, as I mentioned in the application. And then in the business plan, you would outline the hiring projections. Um, if you are buying an existing business, um, or, um, you know, like if you started a new business and you already hired employees, uh, then, um, you would be submitting W2s or, um, you know, pay stubs um, to show that, um, you know, you are paying, um, you are paying these employees or also tax returns, you know, those would show um, the salaries you, um, you have been paying to the, to the employees. Perfect. Um, and now let's move on. And, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, if you're starting a new business in the US, you would be um, you would be generally submitting a business plan with your um, application. Um, so if you are starting a new business, you know, um, almost every consular like they require that you submit a business plan with the application. Um, if you are purchasing an existing business, um, you know, in that case, we wouldn't generally submit a business plan um, if the business is doing well financially. Um, you know, in that case, we would just be submitting the, the company's, you know, tax returns, uh, W-2s, payroll, and, you know, those documents would show, you know, like how much revenue the business is making, um, how many employees um, does it have. Let's say that you are purchasing a business in the US and the business, um, you know, the business is not is not doing that well. You know, the revenues have been decreasing. The business only has like one employee or two employees. Um, in that case, we may want to submit a business plan uh, with the application just to kind of um, explain, you know, like how how do you plan to increase the company's revenue, you know, and to explain, you know, that you'll be, that you plan to hire um, additional employees in the future. Um, so in some cases, when you are purchasing the business, we may want to submit a business plan, uh, but those would generally only be um, if the business you are purchasing is not, is not doing that well. So what should the business plan um, contain? Um, so it should have an executive summary. So this would be the first page of the business plan. And um, this first page would um, just kind of summarize, you know, like who you are, 
uh, what do you do and who do you plan um, to sell you know the products to or who do you plan to you know provide the services to um, the business plan should also have market analysis and and research and then a marketing plan that explains you know like how do you plan to um, you know reach out to the customers obtain customers and just kind of your marketing plan in general um, as I mentioned, you know, the personal plan is going to be extremely important uh, for new uh, for new companies. Um, so in the personal plan, you would want to outline, you know, like how, um, you know, like how many employees do you plan to hire in the next five years? What are their um, job descriptions going to be? What are their positions going to be? And also you would want to um, specify, you know, their, their salaries and whether they are full time or part time. Um, you would want to also include a comprehensive financial plan. So this would be five years of financial projections. Um, so profit and loss um, projections, um, cash flow projections, and balance sheet projections. Um, one question we um, we we often get is um, you know is you know like whether clients can kind of like draft the business plans um, themselves or whether they need to hire a professional. Um, so we generally recommend that unless you have a background, you know, in this industry, that you hire a professional um, just because especially for the new E2 applications, the business plan is going to be like one of the most important documents in the entire E2 visa application. And you would want, um, you know, you would want a professional to um, to draft the business plan to strengthen the application. And uh, we can certainly assist with the business plan drafting as well. Perfect. And now um, Kelly will go over uh, the second part of the presentation. Thank you, Michaela. So um, now that we have kind of a sense of, you know, the, the E2 requirements, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some other issues that can come up with E2s and, and with renewals. Um, one thing we'll talk about first are some E2 developments and adjudication trends. Um, so these are just some things that, you know, we're seeing that are, I think, important to, uh, you know, be aware of. So one is, um, you know, very common question of whether you need to make your actual investment in the United States. Uh, so this isn't a requirement. Um, you know, certainly you can, uh, for example, let's say your company relies on on shipping inventory, um, you know, from, from outside the U.S. You certainly can purchase that inventory outside the U.S. That being said, we have noticed at some consulates, officers will sometimes ask, uh, you know, whether, like, how many expenditures have been made in the U.S. So we, we do think, although it is not required, you know, in the law to have any particular amount of your investment come from, uh, you know, U.S. purchases, it is helpful for the application. And so we we do recommend it. Um, other things to be aware of, you know, so one is administrative processing. So administrative processing can mean a few different things. Um, so let's say that you go to the interview and the officer, there's not, there's a document that they want um, and you don't have it, uh, you know, maybe um, just something extra from the E2 file or, uh, you know, something uh, such as, um, you know, maybe there was a criminal issue in your past and they want a certified, you know, criminal records check, something like that. Um, they'll issue you what's called a 221G. So your case will technically go into administrative process processing. Um, and this is, uh, you know, generally, if it's just a straightforward, you know, paper, then, you know, you could provide it to them and th the case can then move forward. Um, you know, sometimes you get put into administrative processing and it's not really clear why, uh, you know, so that this can often happen if um, maybe your case has been flagged by another security agency. Um, you know, that is also something that's possible. Um, and in that case, it can be a bit more complicated to resolve because the consulate really can't change anything uh, with your application until you get this response. Um, you know, from this agency that that clears you. So um, for that type of administrative processing, it can go on for quite a long time um, for some, you know, for some people even maybe up to or over a year. And really all you can do at that point is continue to follow up at regular intervals, perhaps monthly, um, you know, to, to try to see, you know, if the case can, um, you know, can go forward. Um, another thing 
uh, that is kind of an adjudication trend lately, became much more common during the pandemic, and now maybe is changing back a little bit, was um, kind of more filings with USCIS. Uh, so, you know, one of the benefits of filing for a change of status and an extension of status with USCIS is that you do not have to leave the United States. Um, you can just file the paperwork directly, you know, with the government, and you don't attend an interview. They'll decide everything on the papers. Um, so especially during the pandemic, this became a much more kind of attractive um, option although there are some drawbacks to it, right? So one is you're not getting a visa stamp in your passport. So that means that if you, when you do get to the stage where you want to travel internationally, um, you know, before you can travel, you, you'd need to leave, go to a consulate abroad, get an E2 visa stamp and come back. And the fact that um, you are approved with USCIS for that change or extension of status, it does not mean you'll automatically be approved at the consulate. In fact, the consulate doesn't have to consider that approval at all. Um, you know, it can be a, a positive factor, um, but there's, you know, it, it's not something that they're required to rely on. Um, so sometimes people will think about, well, for an H-1B or an L, I got my approval and then I went to the consulate and it's, you know, essentially a few limited questions and kind of a rubber stamp. Um, that's different for the E-2. So for the E-2, getting the approval in the U.S. with USCIS does not mean you'll automatically be approved at the consulate. Um, and it is something where they will look at it, you know, as a brand new application from scratch. Uh, so those are things to keep in mind. Um, something else that, you know, is always on everyone's minds, I think, are kind of timing at the consulates, right? So, uh, you know, during the pandemic, you know, consular operations shut down, as many things did. And it's really been an ad hoc process of reopening since then. Um, you know, so some consulates are already back, you know, to where they were pre-pandemic, um, you know, uh, London, Toronto, Japan, um, you know, the in, in those places, there's consulates that are pretty much processing, you know, very similar numbers as they did, you know, pre-pandemic and in similar timelines. There are some consulates where it's taken much, much longer for things to normalize and some consulates where things are still not normalized. Um, you know, so for example, and, you know, the consulate in Bogota, like they just started accepting E2 visa applications again relatively recently. Um, and there's still a wait of, you know, even up to and over a year uh, for E2, um, you know, E2 applications. So, the timing at the consulates is very, uh, you know, really all over the place um, and really depends where you're applying. So it is important to discuss with your attorney to figure out, you know, you know, what is the current timeline um, at the consulate where I want to apply? And if it's really too long, are there any other options that I have? All right, let's talk about a few, um, you know, issues and complex areas that come up a lot for E2 visas. Um, you know, so one is the source and trail of funds. Um, so, you know, sometimes when we describe the source of funds requirement, um, which, you know, Michaela described earlier, where you have to show that the funds that you've invested are come from a legitimate source, people will say, oh, well, yeah, the money is in my my bank account. Um, so for the for when, what we mean by the source of funds is where did that money in your bank account come from? Um, you know, was it just personal savings from employment over the years? If so, that can be supported by tax returns. Uh, did you sell a personal property and, you know, the funds were put into your account? Um, then we would want to see the purchase sale agreement for the property and the proof of the money being transferred to you. So it's thinking about like, what is the actual source of the money in the bank accounts? Um, and particularly if you're filing with USCIS, they do a very, very deep dive into exactly where the money came from, you know, how it was maintained. So if you go to a consulate and you're applying with, you know, personal savings, you may be able to provide three years of tax returns and then proof of you transferring money to the U.S., uh, if you're going with USCIS, they will often want to see, you know, your pay stubs, the proof of the payroll being transferred into your particular bank account and then maintained there. Or if it was transferred out somewhere else and held somewhere else like a savings account, they would want to track the flow of the money through those accounts um, to see exactly where the money came from. So that can be something to consider. If you have a very complex trail of funds, you know, perhaps it's very clear where you got the money, but then it was transferred into multiple accounts and it's hard to track. Um, that can be a situation where it may be better to go to a consulate because USCIS will really ask for a lot of detail on this. Um, another uh, thing regarding the source and trail of funds is that you cannot get, take out a loan that is secured by the assets of the E2 company. So let's say you have some personal property, you have a home you own, um, you know, maybe you own a company and you're going to take out a shareholder loan. Those are both fine, but what you cannot do is is, for example, get a loan that is secured by the E2 company's assets. So if you're doing the shareholder loan, that would need to be with another company, not the E2 company. Um, 
Something else to consider, gifts are also um, a possible way to um, to get the investment uh, for the E2. That being said, um, a gift letter alone is not enough. You would need the gift letter and then supporting documentation that explains where you actually where the gift giver got that money. So for example, if your mother is giving you a gift and she has a pension, um, you would need to include kind of the tax return showing the receipt of the pension wages um, or a pension statement um, and then proof of her transferring that money to you along with the gift letter. Um, some other issues that come up, you know, small investment amount. Uh, so, you know, we definitely work a lot with um, clients that are maybe starting smaller service-based businesses and the investment amount is on the lower side. Um, really important if you have a smaller investment amount that you're kind of doing everything possible to make other aspects of the case as strong as possible. Um, we do have a, a webinar that is particularly focused on what the concerns are for people who are applying with low investment amounts or with risky cases. So, um, you know, if that's kind of your situation, I would encourage you to check out, um, you know, those webinars, either a live one or we have, you know, recordings on YouTube as well. Um, so other, other areas that are complex, you know, E2 visas for two investors, people will ask, can I get the E2 with my business partner? Um, you know, so yes, if you own the company 50-50. Um, so in order to be an investor, you need to own at least 50% of the company. Um, you know, so if the company is going, you know, if you and your uh, business partner have the same nationality, let's say you're both from Spain, um, you know, you can own the company 50-50. Or if one of you wants to be a majority owner, um, you know, you could always do an investor and then an E2 employee. If you don't have the same nationality, let's say someone is from, you know, the UK and someone is, is from Spain, you would have to own it 50-50 to both be investors. Um, something else that comes up a lot are substantive changes to the business after you get your E2 visa. Uh, so, you know, let's say you start up a restaurant and, you know, it, it doesn't go well. Um, and, you know, you decide you're going to close it down and start up a wedding photography business um, and you, your E2 visa is still valid. Um, unfortunately, you cannot just shut down the restaurant and start the, the wedding photography business. You would need to go back to either USCIS or to the consulate and submit a new application explaining, you know, what happened and what investment was made to kind of start up this new line of business. Um, so sometimes people think, well, I have a five-year visa in my passport, you know, so no matter what I do during that time, it's a I'm invalid status status, but that's not the case. Um, in order to maintain your status, you do need to be working at the business um, that was represented to the consulate. Now, let's say that you started up a restaurant and it's going really well and you want to open up a little you know, bakery on the side of that. That's not a substantive change that would require going back to the consulate or USCIS. It's really aligned with a lot of what you were already doing, offering you know restaurant services. Um, so for that, that's really not an issue. But if you do um, think you're pivoting your business in some way and you're worried that this might be a substantial change, it's a good idea to speak with an attorney first uh, to make sure that um, you know that that you're kind of going back to the consulate and reporting anything if you need to, or that there's an argument for why this is a natural outgrowth, um, you know, of what you were doing with the E2 company. Um, something else, you know, that that comes up are family business purchases. So when you are purchasing an E2 um, a business, you know, generally the investment is considered substantial if it is the fair market value of the business. So if there is just a seller offering a business on the open market and you, you know, negotiate with them and purchase the business, that's going to be considered substantial generally. Uh, if you're buying from a family member, there's kind of naturally going to be more scrutiny as to whether this is really fair market value for the business. So you want to make sure in those types of cases uh, that you have you know, either a valuation from an objective third party, uh, maybe a CPA has looked at the financials and, and issued an opinion on how much, you know, this business is worth. Um, and, the, you know, the, the amount that you're paying should make sense in light of the financials. So if it's a very successful company with a huge amount of assets and a huge amount of, you know, revenue and profit, you know, and, and you're paying $20,000 for it, you know, that type of thing is, is what will cause the officer to think, you know, maybe this isn't substantial. Uh, so if you are doing a business purchase from a family member, just know there will be more scrutiny. So it, it is good to kind of have some of these other things in place. Uh, so it's clear to the officer that you have paid the fair market value and invested a substantial amount to purchase the business. All right, let's talk about some common reasons for E2 denials. Um, so one, we've talked about a bit, low investment amount. 
Um, you know, this is something that there's certain investments are just too low. And then there's also certain consulates where they're just maybe they're used to seeing much larger companies or used to seeing lots of multinational companies. So lower investment amounts, you know, that are kind of under 100,000 are going to have a much harder time at those at those consulates. Um, nature of the business. So there's just certain areas that receive more scrutiny, you know, so one very common misconception is that you can kind of buy a home or a piece of real estate in the United States, and that could function as your E2 investment. Um, and that's really not, uh, it's, you know, just having a passive, um, you know, real estate investment, where maybe you collect rental in income, or it's just a home that you own, that doesn't work for an E2. It, it's not a real and operating business, you know, it's not going to hire workers in the US. So anytime, an officer sees a real estate business, for example, they're always going to be a little bit more, um, you know, they're, they're going to do a deeper dive, like, you know, have a little bit more scrutiny on it, just because they know that this is something that people, you know, will will do sometimes. Um, so you do want to keep that in mind. Um, you know, another thing can be filing location and venue. I think we've talked a few times during this presentation about how important it is, um, you know, to talk with your attorney to understand, you know, is it better to file with USCIS as a change or extension of status, or should I go to the consulate? Um, you know, a lot of thing factors will play into that, including, you know, timing, um, you know, visa status, how much you have to invest what your source of funds looks like. So all of those strategic considerations are very important. Um, and, and again, there are certain consulates where they just kind of will decide, you know, we don't think anything under this amount is, you know, reasonable for an E2. And, you know, there can be trends like that that happen over the years. Um, consular officers do change posts periodically. And so sometimes when you have a new um, you know, person come in, adjudication trends can change um, over time. So it's always good to, to know what's going on currently with that particular consulate. Another thing that can come up as a denial reason is um, if they're concerned that you're not that the business won't create jobs for U.S. workers. So one of the one of the requirements for the E2 that Michaela went over, the marginality requirement, you know, does require that the the business support more than just the investor and their family. Um, you know, so if somebody has run a, this run a business as a solo consultant in their home country for ten years, and now they say, "Well, I'm going to come be a consultant in the U.S., but I, I swear I'm going to hire people." You know, they may not believe that. Even if you have a good business plan, the fact that you have this extensive history of operating as a solo consultant, you know, may weigh against you. So in that type of case, it may be very helpful to hire somebody before you file, just to make sure that you've addressed that concern, you know, um, proactively. Um, something else that can happen, issues with the adjudicating officer. So consular officers are human beings. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, they're adjudicating, you know, often hundreds of visa applications a day. Uh, you know, there's times where, you know, they are, you know, most of the time I would say our, our, our clients have, you know, good, um, you know, experiences with consular officers where they're either friendly, they're neutral. Um, there are times where they, you know, have poor experiences. And so it is a really good idea, um, you know, if, uh, you know, if, if you do get denied is you want to go home, you want to write down everything that happened uh, at the interview, every question they asked, every answer you gave, um, you know, all of that information can be extremely helpful. Um, you know, if you go back to your attorney and you decide, hey, I want to reapply, um, you know, all of those questions can help give you an idea of where the consular officer's head was at, you know, what the issues were, whether there was a substantive issue with the E2 application, or maybe they were concerned about immigrant intent or, or what it was. Um, so always really important to, um, you know, just kind of keep in mind what you what happened at the interview and then try to write it down right after the interview. Um, other things that can happen, you know, if, if you if the file just didn't meet the requirements at the time of filing, if it wasn't majority owned by treaty country nationals, or if maybe, you know, $1,000 was spent and the rest was cash in a bank account, um, you know, so, you know, these can happen sometimes. Um, and then, you know, you can you can kind of rehabilitate the application and, and refile. All right. So how do you renew an E2 visa? Um, you know, so hiring workers is key. Um, there's many consulates where if you've been approved initially and you're coming back to the same consulate for a renewal, primarily what they're focused on is what do the tax returns look like um, for the company? Is there good revenue? Are there decent profits? Um, and has the company hired employees? You know, how many W-2s and, you know, does the company have? 
or um, sometimes if it's kind of in an industry where it makes sense to have 1099s, um, you know, maybe you just have 1099s, but much, much stronger to have W-2s. As we listed here, we, we generally recommend having at least three full-time equivalent employees by the five, you know, the end of the five years. Um, the salary doesn't matter as long as it aligns with what is required, you know, um, you know, under minimum wage laws and also makes sense in light of the type of, of, of uh, you know, position it is, right? If you're saying you're hiring a you know, an engineer and you're going to pay the minimum wage, you know, you may have a, the, the officer may look at that, you know, um, and, and not really, uh, you know, believe that that's what's really going on there. Um, so in terms of updated financial data, so some consoles ask for all the financials since the last uh, approval, um, much more frequently, they ask for two years, um, you know, be looking for, you know, did, did the company meet revenue targets? Is it profitable? Um, it's definitely not required to kind of go back and compare against the business plan if it's not favorable. So, you know, if you thought that your business would make $700,000 in year two and have six employees, but it actually made $300,000 and you have three employees, um, there's no need to go back and compare it against the business plan. Um, what you would do is focus on where the business is at now, um, what the business is doing now. Um, if there have been any challenges, you can explain them and how the company is working to overcome them. Uh, you know, but you always want to be kind of um, explaining the narrative of the company in a positive way to highlight its successes um, and how it's overcome, you know, any issues it's faced as it's kind of, you know, gotten off the ground. Um, you know, it can be really helpful to explain, like, how did the marketing and sales plan work? Um, you know, if there's, if you have the type of company that, um, you know, is going to get a lots of reviews online, those can be really helpful to show, hey, look, this is a, you know, a business that's really doing really well, has lots and lots of reviews online. Um, if the company is not doing well, and this happened a lot during the pandemic, obviously, people, you know, businesses really suffered. Um, maybe they had to lay off their staff. Um, you know, you can provide kind of a, a shorter version of an updated business plan explaining how we're going to get back on track. Here's how we're going to hire employees. Here's what's happened so far. Um, and that can be very helpful, you know, um, especially if you say, hey, you know, we had five employees, COVID hit, we lost our employees, now we're back at two. Um, so you just want to be thinking about how to how to structure that to, um, you know, paint the business in the best light possible. Um also very important for the E2 renewal, make sure the company still meets those E2 requirements. So it has to be 50% owned by treaty country nationals, or if you're the investor, you need to own 50%. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, if people are um, maybe raising capital, uh, you know, perhaps like the ownership structure has changed and they're not paying as much attention to it. And it can be a really significant problem if the, um, you know, if the ownership falls below 50% of treaty country nationals. Um, you know, changes to the type of business. We talked about this a bit earlier. Uh, you know, you cannot just completely change the type of business you're doing without going back to the consulate first. Um, if you do think you're going to have multiple types of businesses, you can contemplate that in your initial application and your business plan. If you say, hey, we're going to offer software consulting services, but we're also going to do mobile app development. Um, and that's going to be a big part of our, you know, our business starting in year four or five. So you do want to be thinking about, you know, what are your long-term plans and can you incorporate that into your business plan? So there's an argument that you don't have to go back um, you know, and make a new investment and have a new application if there's substantive changes to the, you know, the main business um, that you have. All right, so we've reached the end of the presentation. I think um, there is uh, one question here. Um, can I apply for an E2 visa solely as an exporter of used laptops to Pakistan, or do I need to open a retail laptop business in the U.S.? what would be considered a substantial investment for this type of business? Um, so uh, I think, you know, this is a very, very specific question. So I would say for a more detailed response, um, I'd say set up a consultation with us, uh, which you can do through our website. Um, generally, if you want to have an E2, um, you know, visa application, you do have to have a, a U.S. entity, like a, you know, a company in the United States. If that company is then primarily, um, you know, servicing, uh, you know, people from another country, um, that's okay. Like you can have clients um, or be, you know, but the comp but the company itself, the employees, the revenues, all of that would have to be based in the United States. Um, in terms of what a substantial investment is for that type of business, um, that's something that we would have to discuss, you know, on a consult. Again, there's no number. It's really about what can you 
as the applicant argue is a reasonable amount like to get the company to the point of being operational? Do you need office space? Do you need, um, you know, contracts with a warehouse? Do you need kind of, you know, payments for marketing and website, um, you know, professional fees, you know, logistics planning? Um, so all of those things, you know, would need to be, you know, taken into account, um, you know, for, for the application. Right. So I think that was um, all of the uh, all of the questions that we had. So I think we'll stop here. Um, thank you so much, Michaela, for sh sharing your knowledge. I hope um, thank you for your great questions. Hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.